Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Sally Whipple. I'm the Director of Education here, and I am very pleased to welcome you to one of our lunchtime lectures. We have lectures just about every month, and if you want to get on our email list to learn more about those, you may sign up on a survey form, and we will get information to you. Um, we have some great programs coming up, and we're very excited about today's program as well. Um, I would like to introduce to you now Pat Sheehan, who is the chairman of the board of the Connecticut Public Affairs Network and also a UConn alumnus. Pat? Thank you, Sally. And thank you all for being here on this uh, beautiful day. As uh, Sally mentioned, I am chairman of the Connecticut Public Affairs Network and also a very proud alum of the university. So it's great to have President Herbst come and join us in this wonderful historic building where we can discuss the future of the university and, in fact, the future of the state of Connecticut. Uh, the old state house and the University of Connecticut are not in common on a timeline. This was the building that was the seat of government for the state of Connecticut until 1878, and the University of Connecticut was founded in, all the alums can tell us, 1881. Thank you. <laughs> However, the university has often used this facility uh, for the symbolism and the history that it uh, symbolizes uh, here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, the first capital campaign for the University of Connecticut, which was actually kicked off in 1984 by President John DiBiagio, was kicked off right here at the old state house. It was a $25 million capital campaign. Uh, Provost Albert Waugh, who also served as interim president on several occasions, also sat in this chamber and upstairs as a delegate to the 1965 Constitutional Convention for the state of Connecticut. And after he retired as president of the University of Connecticut, Homer Babbage, who was a person before he was a library, Homer Babbage <laughs> was also the chairman of the development committee for the Old State House Association. So it is a venue that is open to the university. We welcome Susan to these halls, and we certainly hope that she will use this facility uh, to symbolize the seat of culture, if you will, in the state of Connecticut. It is indeed a pleasure to have her here joining with the colleagues from the past. As a matter of uh, her background, Susan was born in New York. She was raised in Peekskill, New York. and. She was appointed as 15th president of the University of Connecticut back in December. She assumed her office in June. She brings to her office a distinguished academic career and uh, degrees in political science and communication from Duke University and the University of Southern California, teaching positions at Northwestern, at Temple University, the State University of New York at Albany, and Georgia Tech. She began teaching right out of grad school. She took a position at the uh, Northwestern University in 1989, and her leadership position in academia also began at Northwestern, where barely into her 30s, uh, she took on an American Studies program as a director. Within two years, she had been selected as chair of the political science department at that university. Two years later, she was named associate dean for faculty affairs. In 2003, she left Northwestern for Temple University in Philadelphia, where she spent two years as the dean of the School of Liberal Arts, before moving to the provost's position at the State University of New York at Albany. Something unusual happened when she came into that position uh, as provost. Uh, a year later, the president of the university, Kermit Hall, passed away, and provost Susan Herbst became acting president Susan Herbst. She was recruited a year later to Georgia, where she took on the extraordinary opportunity to serve as the executive vice chancellor and chief academic officer for not one, but for 35 colleges and universities that make up the Georgia university system. She was responsible for more than 300,000 students and some 10,000 faculty members. Last fall, Susan Herbst was presented as a candidate for the position of president of the University of Connecticut, shortly after the publication of her latest book, very timely in our times, a book about civility in public life, civility in politics. She's an outstanding communicator. She understands the place of great universities 
in the not just the academic but the economic and social and political life of our state and of the country. And she comes to Connecticut with a passion for excellence and for achievement. She's not only a president, she is also a mother and a sister and a wife. She and her husband, Doug, are raising two teenagers. She also is uh, uh, probably someone who is, is motivated from the home breakfast table, whatever they were serving in Peekskill. We should all find the recipe. It should be patented. Uh, as many of you may know, Susan is not the first university president in her family. Her older brother is, in fact, the president of uh, Colgate University. And her younger brother is a vice president of NASCAR. So when you talk about getting off to a fast start, no one has done it as well as President Susan Herbst. Please welcome her and Diane. The questions are yours. Thank you very much, Pat. Madam President, it is very nice to have you here. We're thrilled, especially because, uh, for those who don't know, your formal inauguration is coming up at the end of this week, so uh, then you're really ours. That's right. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, just today, a U.S. News and World Report issued its uh, list of top colleges and universities in the United States, and for the first time, UConn has cracked the top 20 in public universities under your watch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, only here a couple of months, but but had a big impact. That's that's a fast uh, start. There yeah. really is, but that's, that's a wonderful thing. It's it's huge for us because um, in getting into the top 20 public research universities, um, we leap over some amazing places. Uh, we are ahead of the University of Minnesota, Purdue, Rutgers. These are storied, you know, institutions. Uh, so this is, I think, a real recognition of the good work that the faculty and staff do at UConn, but also our reputation, which is part of that formula that U.S. News uses. So you'll be hearing a lot about that statistic. We're glad to hear it. Uh, President Herbst, uh, you said when you were first appointed to this position that this is a dream job. Okay, now you've had a few months to get a close look. Is it still a dream it job? It is. It really is. And uh, even more so than I thought. Uh, you know, I knew from a distance uh, that UConn had many pockets of academic excellence and achievement. Um, it's a state that cares about higher education. It's a progressive state. But being here is, is even better. It's a very warm place, very welcoming. So many people in this room, Pat included, um, have been such great counselors to me and, and so um, helpful in trying to help me find my way and my connections with, um, with the community here. So uh, it's even better than I thought. Uh, one of the things that's really striking to me is the incredible pride that people have in the university. Uh, the alumni certainly, our stakeholders, our donors, legislators, but um, the kids on campus. I have ne I've been on many university campuses uh, all over the country, and I have never seen so many students in the university's gear <laughs> on campus. Um, you know, you can't walk three feet without seeing some kind of Yukon uh, shirt, and um, it really it speaks volumes about pride in place. So very striking and, and, and very fitting. I'll just mention as an aside, there's a new uh, little spot uh, that was just produced about the new president coming to campus, and I think it's going to be airing on UConn's uh, YouTube channel, and I had a chance to look at it. You can find it in Rick Green's column if you link to it. Um, some very nice things where you're talking about the university and all that, and then you have some fun going to the campus bookstore and not only trying on all that UConn gear, but I believe this is the first university president who ever tried on the Jonathan costume. <laughs> it's very, it's very uh, hot in there. <laughs> I don't recommend it, but it, no, was, it was fun for a few minutes. <laughs> um, one of the things that, um, that's been very striking in this year is that with budget problems in states all across the country, many state universities are losing money, cutting back on faculty, and yet this uh, administration made a big commitment uh, to spend money at UConn uh, in a number of ways. How are how are we different, and why are we different from all those other states that are struggling with that? Uh, it, it's it's incredible, and so as you know, many of you here, uh, the governor and the legislature invested mightily in the health center and also the stores campus. On the health center campus, a new project called Bioscience Connecticut, which is meant to put our hospital on better footing, but really serve as an economic development engine for the state, um, educating more doctors and dentists, bringing more clinicians and researchers to the 
university who will then bring in more federal money through invention and, um, and that has a multiplier effect on the Connecticut economy. Then an equally important project on the Storrs campus um, led by the governor and Don Williams. Uh, so many people, uh, several people in this room were very helpful in, uh, in anointing a, a tech park on the Storrs campus that's probably going to be devoted more toward engineering and uh, material sciences. But these are huge investments. I can't, I just, I feel incredibly lucky. Uh, most universities, public universities, especially around the country, are struggling. They don't see this kind of investment from state government. So we're just, we're very fortunate to have a governor, a legislature, who really believe that uh, we should be a great university and that we are part of the economic recovery. So um, we're grateful. You know, we argued for it, but the truth is we're, we're recipients of it and some really good vision on the part of our state leaders. One of the things that you're doing now is uh, looking for a vice president for economic development um, to really turn the university into an engine of development for the state. Specifically, what would that person do? This is one of our most important appointments, and it's a, it's a new position that you're starting to see at more research universities. Um, it, years ago, university presidents, when they spoke about economic development and contributions to the economy, it was just that we employ a lot of people. And we do. <laughs> we, we employ many, many people around the state, and that we bring people to campuses where then they spend money in the local community. Uh, I'd say the last decade that has changed tremendously, where universities, sophisticated universities, see their role as partnering with industry, bringing in new industry to Connecticut, um, and trying to figure out how to create jobs, especially through research and education um, with companies. So uh, we do need leadership in this area. Uh, we have some very good research leaders, many good research leaders at UConn, both in the Health Center campus and in stores, but we do need somebody to envision and pull together all of the different, you know, sort of pockets of innovation. Uh, this person will be obviously very central to, um, to the governor and his efforts as he tries to bring more industry to Connecticut and create jobs. Uh, this person will help faculty um, who have ideas for invention, ideas for companies that will employ people, and they need help with business plans and venture capital and, and that sort of thing. So um, we're actually looking at candidates right now and have stellar people from around the country interested in the University of Connecticut, and I think it's because of the state support and also just, you know, the, the breadth of our disciplines and the, and the possibilities. So this is, is a, probably one of the most important appointments that, that we'll make in my time, and uh, we want somebody who's, who's perfect for it. UConn has had a pretty good record of keeping alumni in the state. Um, but one of the things that the governor is very aware of and the legislature and, and many, many leaders in the state, including business leaders, is that there's a drain of young people leaving Connecticut. So how do we get more of those UConn grads uh, in the future generations or in the succeeding classes to also make their homes here and stay here? Yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's a struggle in the Northeast and the Midwest, which is losing population even more quickly than we are. Um, the goal is to create jobs and to create very good jobs. Um, hence the Bioscience Connecticut Project, which is meant to not only create the construction jobs that we'll need early on to put up the buildings, but then jobs in research and technology. So I think, the, you know, the more jobs we can create, the more likely we are to keep the kind of educated people, ambitious people that UConn, UConn creates um, to keep them in the state. So, you know, it really is on us to try to transform this economy and, um, and produce more of those professional jobs, especially in areas that are high paying. So um, it's up to us, uh, and it, it is about economics. I mean, we can produce um, many plays and pieces of art and all kinds of um, cultural events that draw people to the university, but, you know, the truth is that people have to raise families and make ends meet. So you know, creating jobs is, is, is vital. We talked quite a bit um, so far about state funding and state support, um, but you have emphasized uh, since before you even came to campus that part of your role is going to be to find private money, to find donations to the university. And you certainly uh, put your money where your mouth is in a real way when you and your husband donated $100,000 for scholarships for UConn students. How do we go about getting the private dollars that the school needs, and how do you, in your role as president, help facilitate that? 
Sure, it's a, it's a great question, and uh, the truth is, even with our incredibly generous state support from the governor, from the legislature, uh, much of our future is in philanthropy and building our endowment. Our endowment is a little over $300 million right now. We should be closer to a billion dollars. That is, that's a heavy lift. I didn't say when <laughs> we would get to a billion dollars, um, but that's where we need to be for a research university of our size, our stature, our complexity. Um, getting there is, it's a matter of, you know, making friends. There are so many UConn alumni who have done incredibly well, who are capable of great philanthropy, um, who haven't heard from us in a while. Uh, so we need to build up our fundraising infrastructure, um, get our development officers, we call them, out into the, uh, into the state and the country, and find people who are willing to help us. Uh, I think it's true all over the country that the days of, you know, of, you know, higher and higher state support are over. Um, the state has a lot of mouths to feed. Um, there's a lot of people in need. So we really have to do our part um, to build up the fundraising. I did just one last note on that. My husband and I did give our gift to the humanities and the mm -hmm. fine arts, which are often um, overlooked. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got these incredibly uh, dazzling projects like Bioscience Connecticut, um, Invention, you know, very sexy stuff. Yeah. And uh, sometimes people forget that the liberal arts um, the humanities in particular and the fine arts are the center of what we do. Um, we are about teaching ethics, values, argument, critique, and making citizens, and that's where the liberal arts come in. And, uh, you know, I hope that our emphasis on them will, will steer a lot of people to giving in the humanities and the fine arts, where your money goes a long way. <laughs> you know, you give money to the sciences, and, uh, you know, some of that equipment is pretty expensive, and, and we need those <laughs> gifts, too. Um, but giving money in the humanities and the, the social sciences, the fine arts, can just be incredibly useful to faculty, especially. And while I understand that students need to feel that they're going to graduate and be able to pay back their students, loans and be able to start a life and make a living, what I get concerned about when I hear about the emphasis that business wants to place on building the workforce is that there's more to college than vocational school or vocational training, if you will. There's more to college than figuring out um, how to do your job when you graduate. It's also, I think, about figuring out who you are in the world and why you are in the world and what the world is all about, a, a much bigger picture than just preparing myself to become a CPA or to become an attorney or to become a researcher. Yeah, we take that very seriously. It's why the University of Connecticut has examined and re-examined its general education requirements to make sure that students are forced into those classes, even though sometimes they'd rather, you know, just work on engineering or just work on their, um, their business degrees. But we really feel like we don't just educate students, we create citizens, and hopefully citizens that, that stay in Connecticut and improve the communities. You talked, uh, as we began this conversation, a bit about the pride that people have in the university. You mentioned the students who have uh, every third kid has a Yukon shirt on. Well, if you drive through the state, you'll see that about every fourth or fifth person has a Yukon shirt on. And a lot of us didn't go to Yukon, but we have a very strong attachment to it. And let's face it, in large part, it's because of our affection for and our, our admiration of our sports teams. Uh, here in Connecticut, we don't have big time professional sports right now, so we really have lacked on to our sports teams. So that means, of course, that sports plays a big part, a big role in the school, and you have been pretty clear that you understand that and that you also have a direction that you want the sports division to go into, including uh, looking for a new sport, a new athletic director. That's right. Um, athletics is it's critical to what we do and who we are, and I am the envy of almost all Division I presidents in terms of the kind of season that we had, you know, between the Fiesta Bowl and men's and women's basketball and baseball. I mean, it, it just it could not have been better. Uh, we're incredibly proud of that. Uh, one of the things that we need to do in terms of our signal, you know, to the world about the University of Connecticut is to take that academic, that athletic excellence and um, open people's eyes to the rest of the university. So, you know, it's through athletics, like nothing else, that you grab people by the collar and say, look at UConn. And, and we have that already. There's a lot of people um, surrounding us, very interested in us because of the athletics. And we need to pull them in further and show them that we have a wonderful dental school, a fabulous school of education, and, and all the parts of a comprehensive research university that make us very proud. 
um, but to athletics more specifically, um, it's a very tough time in, in collegiate sports right now. It's a very confusing time, and it's very complicated. There are a lot of new kinds of players on the scene who we didn't expect, um, who are trying to, in many cases, take advantage of students and their families. Uh, there is a lot of money involved, and, and there's a lot of risk. Uh, for me, you know, when I talk to both the people in athletics and our stakeholders around the state, I emphasize that, you know, our two greatest priorities are the academic, is the academic success of our athletes. They are student athletes, and student comes first, and it's in bold, bold type. Um, and uh, we expect our students to do well while they're at University of Connecticut and to graduate. So um, academic excellence on the part of the athletes is vital. Um, we have some wonderful examples. The women's basketball team is, is, um, is chronically um, populated by terrific students. So um, in general, our athletes do well in there, but we can do much better in, in certain sports. Uh, also, um, compliance. The NCAA rules have gotten unbelievably complex and confusing, as the NCAA is, you know, uh, freely admits. So there's a lot of revisiting right now about rules of compliance. The challenge is that there are so many rules, they're so complicated, they don't always make sense to people in the way they fit together, um, that it's hard for even the most compliant program or coach, you know, to stay focused on what they need to do um, and still, and still, you know, serve the university. So compliance and academics are, are tied for number one. Um, after that is funding and fundraising. Um, we do, uh, we can do a lot better in terms of our um, athletic fundraising and the kind of facilities that we have for our athletes. And then, um, I hate to say, but winning really is, is last. Um, we, we will win into the future. We are an incredible storied program. Uh, but the truth is our, our, our goal is to, to make sure that these are student athletes, that they do graduate, they do well, um, and that we stay within NCAA rules. So I think we can still win, uh, even with all those other pressures. But um, winning is, is not what collegiate athletics was supposed to be about. It's just something we happen to do very well. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned recently, and I think you had been to a meeting or a retreat of, uh, with other presidents of schools that are in the NCAA Division I, that presidents have not been involved enough in athletics. Uh, how do you intend to be more involved to make sure that uh, the academic performance improves? We know we've had problems with that on the men's basketball mm -hmm. team as well as other places. How will you get in there and be involved in that? And you're, you're absolutely right. This is um, one of the, the most worrisome things that's happened in, in collegiate sports is that the athletics department, um, the athletes, the coaches, everybody become untethered from the rest of the university and its mission. So many, the, what, that's what we talked about um, out in Indianapolis is how to you know, pull the athletics department closer to the core of the university and its academic mission. Um, so there are a lot of aspects to it, but um, how I plan to do that is um, putting in the time most of all, is that the president really has to be willing to be in the athletics department a lot, to be in constant conversation um, with coaches and athletes where possible, certainly the athletic director and his or her staff, um, and to just, you know, be there a lot. Also, I um, reconstituted, uh, and it's an NCAA-required committee, the President's Athletic Advisory Committee. Um, it, it's a committee that must exist, but you can really use that um, to keep athletics on a proper path. So I reconstituted that. I'll meet with them very often. Um, I have asked them to pay very close attention to academic performance and compliance. They are a very serious group of some of our very best faculty. So um, that's one of the mechanisms to use. But for me, I think most of all, it's being in athletics a lot and showing them that um, we have high expectations for them uh, in terms of you know, compliance, academics, and winning. But we also support them. And uh, something that most people don't understand, I was not a college athlete. Nothing even close. <laughs> Certainly not a Division One college <laughs> athlete. Um, how hard it is to to perform as they do. Uh, remember, they travel a lot, they practice a lot, and they also have to keep up their studies. And um, the stress and the pressure on them is unbelievable. So we too at the university have to do our part to support them in terms of facilities, in terms of study rooms, in terms of their practice schedules and class schedules. And I'm not sure we've always done that. So, you know, in addition to demanding mm -hmm. that they be good students, we have to support them in that because we glory in their tremendous victory. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
it's, it's very hard on those men and women, and, and um, those of you who have been in college athletics know that, but I think most of America doesn't understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that um, we talked about recently or, or heard you talking about recently having to do with um, the practice facility uh, for basketball, and I think you are just mentioning that, that um, is that a, a facility that would not only be for practice but also be a place where the student athletes can study, can get tutoring, can do their work in and around the other schedule? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's my highest priority with this new um, basketball practice facility, which would be likely located at, uh, on the old memorial field mm -hmm. next to Gamble, and uh, hopefully the two buildings will be connected. But it would have a, uh, it has a men's side, and the architectural plans are, the, it has a men's side uh, and a women's side, and they are equal, <laughs> and they're both beautiful. Uh, practice courts, but also uh, coaches' offices. Then in the middle of the building are tremendously uh, uh, spacious, uh, spacious uh, very well-equipped study rooms, um, weight training, and uh, dining facilities where the, the men and women athletes can be together. But it wouldn't only be used for, for basketball. There's a lot. That's a lot of space um, for a lot of our teams and intramural sports to practice. We have a real shortage of space on campus for our non-D1 teams and programs. So um, it'll take some pressure off of Gamble. A lot of people want to use the floor of Gamble for events and conferences and programs because it's our biggest space, biggest mm -hmm. indoor space. So this practice facility will free that up, and I, I think that will be a good thing for, for the campus. I have one question I want to ask you, and then I want to open it up to the floor, and that is um, this is the book that Pat was referring to. It's uh, Susan Herb's most recent book, and it's called Rude Democracy, Civility and Incivility in American Politics. And the reason I bring this up is that here at the Old State House, the mission really is to promote civic engagement to get people into political discourse to discuss policy issues. But clearly there's been a huge problem in our country with how people do that. In this book, you not only lay out several cases, but you do reach some conclusions and make some recommendations. Without taking up too much time, so we still have time for the audience, tell us about a few of those conclusions that you reach and directions that you think we ought to be looking at. Sure. And uh, by the way, uh, the, the cover image, my, my teenage son actually thought of this. <laughs> it's, a, it's a famous incident in, uh, in the 1850s on the floor of the U.S. Senate where um, one of the congressmen, it's during the, 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 the height of debate over, over civil war and uh, upcoming civil war and slavery, and uh, a congressman really does come over to the Senate side of the Capitol um, to try to kill Senator Sumner. Um, over slavery issues. So it's meant to say that um, while we have a lot of incivility here in 2011, uh, there were darker days in the United States. Um, <laughs> and you, you don't see that kind of thing on the floor of the well, Senate that makes me anymore. Feel yeah, so let's put we things have in some security now, anyway. <laughs> um, but we have, America has had its ups and downs with regard to civility. Uh, I think, in, and we do, um, I do at the end of the book, try to try my hand at some solutions. Although political scientists, we're not great with solutions. We're good at uh, diagnosing. <laughs> the problem and putting it in historical context, but um, I do think the answer is probably in education and uh, K-12 to education, certainly in higher education, where, you know, we do teach civics and we teach children about three branches of government and checks and balances and who's on the Supreme Court, but we really don't teach them the most important part of being a citizen, which is knowing how to argue. How to, uh, how to have an opinion, how to have a respectful opinion, how to engage and debate with some tolerance with people around you, and how to listen. And uh, there, are, there are so many incredibly uh, creative teachers out there, K-12 to teachers, many of whom are, in, are in the, at the middle school level, who have wonderful resources on the web about how you teach children argument um, within classes, within disciplines. Uh, and so, you know, so much of the future lies in the next generation, uh, generations. I think that uh, people of our age, um, we're probably pretty set in our ways. We can learn to be a little bit better, but um, we are incredibly partisan and we're incredibly divided. So the future has to be in young people. Um, but we, we can teach them how to argue, how to critique, how to debate. Um, how to be passionate without being uncivil. And I think that's the, that's the hardest thing to do. Um, and I see that among, with my own students over the years of teaching is that once they get very passionate about a subject, um, they, they get worried. 
that they're going to offend somebody. They just they don't know how to debate properly. So I was a former high school debater, so I was very close to my heart, and I think that's a wonderful activity um, for people who want to learn how to do this. And uh, the more we can um, require uh, these kind of debate skills and argument classes in high schools and even colleges, I think the, the further we'll get in transforming the culture. Uh, I also argue in there that we don't know how to listen anymore. Um, one of the things that's happened in our media environment is that we self-select into the media that we already agree with. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it's, you know, it's, it's easy. And you do. You find people at the workplace who, are in, who you know you're going to agree with already because um, in this kind of therapeutic culture of Dr. Phil and Oprah, like everybody wants to protect everybody else's um, esteem, and you don't want to offend people. So then you, what you do is instead of trying to figure out how to argue with people constructively, you just find people who are like you so that it won't go bad. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's one of the challenges of American culture right now. Um, I don't know that in the next presidential campaign um, that uh, we're going to get a lot of lessons on this. We'll see. Uh, maybe there will be, a, maybe it will be one of those campaigns that's incredibly um, civil and complicated and interesting and and uh, useful. Um, but uh, I worry, <laughs> yeah. given the, the signs and the foreshadowing. So. Oh, I'd like to think that uh, you're right on that and that it will be that way. And um, I know that uh, our Secretary of the State is here today, Denise Merrill, and she's been heading a group that is looking at the Civic Health Index of Connecticut. And um, you sit on that group, and it's something that I think we're all really concerned about and really do want to take a new direction on. Um, I'd like to let the audience get in on this. Um, if you just stand up when you ask your question, that would be great. Yes, sir. Well, I look forward to reading your book. Um, meanwhile, some of us today heard from Dr. Christina Kishimoto, the superintendent of schools in Hartford, and she reviewed the last five years of change and progress in Hartford, but also a vision for going forward. To what extent do you imagine yourself individually and your university, my university, uh, being involved in the reform efforts in Hartford and in other districts across the state? Well, I have a lot to learn about uh, Connecticut um, K-12 education. Um, in Georgia, we were very fortunate. Uh, the office I was in with the Board of Regents worked very closely with the, with the public schools around the state, and we did win the race to the top um, money from the Obama administration. That was you know, several hundred millions of dollars to work on public schools. And, you know, Connecticut uh, you know, was not in that yes. competition or did not win, um, so we just we have to do it ourselves. Uh, the university can be a tremendous partner, as I saw in Georgia, to the public schools, not only winning big grant money, but also um, teacher training, teacher preparation, most of all. Um, also, uh, the education of leaders, of superintendents. We are uh, incredibly proud of the NEAG School of Education. That is the nexus where this has to happen. Um, the faculty in the NEAG School are experts on everything from superintendent training and teacher prep to uh, charter schools. And just, you know, the nature of home life and how that challenges um, uh, the urban public school system. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be through the NEAG School, lots of projects underway already, and I look forward to supporting them. That's a great question. Next question. Yes. Two of your siblings have such heavy leadership positions. What was in your cereal? What was your I don't know. It didn't look that good uh, you know, back when it was going on. You know, when we were little, it was it was pretty. Uh, Pretty rough and tumble, but um, I don't know. My parents are, uh, they are both great pro uh, products of um, public higher education. And my father was a, a German immigrant, and my mother, uh, you know, grew up very poor in Brooklyn. And uh, City College is where they both went to, and that, you know, that changed their life. My mother, you know, could go to Brooklyn College because it was, it was so cheap, and she lived at home. And uh, my father went back to college on the GI Bill. And um, they both love America. Uh, you know, they are the greatest generation. They're people who took citizenship very seriously. And, you know, I don't want to make it sound like the Kennedys, but we did talk about politics at the <laughs> dinner table. We did. Because um, everybody's interested in politics. And uh, 
I think that you know both my brother and I, especially being we were high school debaters together. Oh, we're okay. on the same team, and it was not always Those pretty. Those must have been a few difficult years. There's more fighting with each other than with the other team, <laughs> um, but uh, I think we were both uh, organized that way. And then in my my younger brother, who's who's just terrific. You know, he's he's the non-academic, yeah. um, and he's had a great career in sports management. But um, I don't know. It's you know I I owe it to my parents who are just very engaged citizens. You know, I think my book is dedicated to my father, who was kind of like, when you read in democratic theory, what's the perfect citizen like? I mean, he was that. Uh, you know, always read the newspaper, voted. You know, when elected officials or, or campaigners come to the door, you know, always wanted to talk about politics with them. Um, and just, you know, just an overall strong member of the community. So there are people like that. And I just, I was fortunate to grow up with them. I want to be a fly on the wall at your Thanksgiving dinner with your brothers. Yeah. <laughs> Who else has a question? Yes, sir. Uh, I got your email this morning, and I was very impressed that you're, you've, you've established office hours to, to meet with, with students and uh, faculty and parents. I thought that was a terrific idea. And, and uh, question on, uh, on uh, how you – it seems like you're, you're trying to improve the performance standards and measurements of, of a lot of your operations that have come in running with, with some important changes. Uh, how do you measure quality and get the standards for, for faculty performance uh, within the constraints of a tenure system? Do you have any ideas? Oh, it's, an, it's an excellent question. And it's funny, a few years ago, we, um, when I was in Albany, we hosted, I think there were 20 or 25 uh, Chinese university presidents came, and uh, they wanted to see how an American university ran as they built their gigantic system of higher education, public higher education. And they asked me that same question. They said uh, tenure was very interesting to them because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. And they said, why would anybody do any work um, ever again if they had a job guaranteed for life? And, uh, you know, it, yeah, then I was forced to being a longtime tenured professor, you know, how to articulate it and, <laughs> and defend it, um, which I do and which I will, you know, to the death. Um, it was, you know, originally tenure was, um, was um, implemented to make it so that faculty would have free speech, would have protected speech, and could always question the world, uh, the government, the university without being punished for that. Um, and it has served that purpose incredibly well. You know, academe, I feel like, is one of the few last places in America where you can say anything and think anything, and that's uh, applauded, and that's a good thing. Um, in terms of productivity, uh, I find that a research university like Connecticut, most people are incredibly ambitious. The kind of people who become academics and go on the tenure line, um, they tend to be workaholics, and they tend to be very much driven by discovery. Um, by writing, by thinking, by invention. So um, they're not, they don't need to be motivated. They do need to be supported. And that's where we are at UConn right now is we have some uh, faculty that, you know, manage to get very big federal grants that are incredibly supported. So they have the equipment they need, the staff they need to, to invent, um, form companies, publish, do all those things. But we have a lot of other faculty who are just as ambitious but who may not be in fields where there are big grants available. So um, the, most of the social sciences, certainly political science, my field, or history and then the humanities, um, there is no National Institutes of Health. There's no CDC. There's no The NSF doesn't fund most of our kind of projects. So um, those people need um, research assistance. They need decent office space. Um, they need to be able to travel to conferences to learn what's going on in their discipline. Um, and they certainly need support um, to keep up with all the bells and whistles that the students expect these days in the classroom. So I don't think, I mean, there are some institutions where there's a motivational problem. That's not our problem at UConn. Our problem is trying to support all the innovation and, and ambition that we have. So, uh, and, and people look to the administration for that because um, the truth is that no matter how ambitious you are or talented you are, if you don't have the right equipment or the right labs or the right staff, you're not going to invent anything. Um, it's one of the reasons why so much of my time is and will be spent on philanthropy is that we really need to support the faculty to, to reach their goals. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah.
What are you going to tell the parents who come in to visit you during those office hours and say, my son or daughter can't graduate in four years because he or she can't get all the required courses? There aren't enough options for them to get their classes. This is, uh, you know, people say, what are you really worried about? And it's not the health center, thanks to Bioscience Connecticut. Um, it's not athletics. It's not, you know, our emergency preparedness. It is that we don't have enough faculty to teach our students. Um, that's, you know, we, with all of our budget cuts, we have been pretty good about um, protecting the academic mission. By that I mean the mission of the classroom and, and research. And uh, now the economy is such that we are now affecting the academic mission. And we don't have enough faculty um, so that we don't have, and if you don't have enough faculty, you don't have enough classes for students to take the course they want to when, you know, when it's appropriate. Uh, so we do have some students that plan on graduating a certain month and have to stay an extra semester because they couldn't get a class. That's the thing that would keep any president up at night. It's very serious. I feel like every student who comes to the University of Connecticut that wants to finish in four years and is willing to put in the work to do that should be able to do that. So in terms of our you know, business model and our finances over the next few years, um, having the size faculty we need so that we can really attend to the students is central. Uh, and, you know, you can only teach so many students um, a semester. You, the more students you have, the less attention you're able to pay to each one of them. So um, size and support of our faculty is, is job one for us. So one answer would be if you start teaching a couple of classes, that would be. <laughs> That's right. But it would be a small class, so I wouldn't put a dent in this. Uh, you know, I, I have taught the last few years. I taught at Georgia Tech. And I, usually, I like to teach in the fall during election season because I'm a political scientist. But that would be, yeah, that would only be 15, 20 students. I can't handle more than no, that. No, that's not going to get And, you know, give them, give them what they need. But I think it would be great for the president uh, to be in the classroom. Who else has a question that they'd like to ask the president? Yes, in the back there. Future meetings like this, I'm really enjoying the opportunity to listen to your, your candid thoughts. I too got the email this morning and have been reading your thoughts on your blog and really look forward to seeing those as well. And, and just, I like having this opportunity like without having to go up stores or whatever. So can you elaborate on how you plan to use technology and forums like this to be out in the community more? Yeah, well, I'm happy to come back again <laughs> whenever you like me. Great. Um, but I will absolutely be down in Hartford a lot. Um, we have uh, so many stakeholders for this university who are interested in us, who care about us, and they need to hear the candid uh, news about you know, what's going on, what's really going on, what are we proud of, what are we worried about. And you know, I hope to communicate that you know, in person as best I can, but also um, through the blog. Uh, and through the many other social networking possibilities that I'm not expert at. <laughs> but we have great people in our communications department who, um, who are good at you know, trying to get out the message and also get the feedback. Because I, I really do love to get email from you know, faculty, students, staff, parents, and you know, just people around the state who have ideas. It's, it's really fun for me, and I welcome it. It hasn't really been a complete bed of roses since you got here. Of course, there was the uh, controversy over the separation from the University of Jeff, Jeff Hathaway, the athletics mm -hmm. director. There's been some discussion about the two top cops who are now gone, who had salaries that even shocked some big city police commissioners who made less than they did. And then there's been the discussion about overtime for nurses who are part of the managed care program. Um, those kinds of things give you a few bumps in the road sure. along the way. They do, but, uh, you know, they are also instructive to us. And, um, the, you know, some of those are personnel cases and, and they're complicated. But um, in terms of salaries, for example, you know, I do think that we have, uh, we have to do a better job of making sure that, the, especially when people are at the higher end of the salary scale, and we will need to hire those people. The Vice President for Economic Development, if you want somebody good, you know, you're going to have to pay for that kind of quality. Um, we just have to make sure it's within national norms. And that's actually not very hard to do. It's something that I've done, you know, when I've hired people in, in the past at universities. Um, you just have to be very cognizant of that. Um, I think University of Connecticut is a, is a good enough place, is a great place that we can attract very good people and stay within those salary norms. So, you know, each of these cases is instructive. Um, but, uh, but again, it's not, especially the, um, the uh, police chief salary business, I mean, that is not going to stop us from hiring quality people either. And I'm happy to, 
to defend at length, you know, hiring somebody um, at a competitive salary because that's what we need to do to move the university ahead. How about a nurse who earns $95,000 in one year in overtime? Is that a case of poor management um, of the nursing uh, staff? Uh, well, I'm no expert on the on the nursing management front, but from what I understand over the last few years, we brought the over time costs way down. So it's a work in progress. And, you know, granted, we don't want to see those kind of data, but um, the last few years we've done incredibly well in bringing that down. That said, you know, nurses are a special case, and I think you'll find, you won't find any other problems like that at UConn. Um, nurses are, are very skilled people. Um, not everybody can do those jobs or do them in the settings, the specialized settings that nurses work in now. So um, we are a 24-7 operation at the health center and um, other facilities where our nurses are located and uh, you know our main goal is the health and safety of the patients so uh, keeping that front and center you know we were trying to do better on the overtime management and it's it's well taken anybody with a question yes right here a long, long time ago I remember there was no tuition when I started in 1961 my semester cost college fee was $75 and a $10 processing fee. <laughs> when I left, it was $95 with the processing fee. And I just lament, especially because of um, retaining our recently publicized male basketball coach, it seemed to me what I was reading in the media is that his salary was not competitive. His salary was really over the top. And if you compare it to professor salaries, it just bothers me enormously. And I think that people who um, are creative and innovative with inventions and all kinds of breaking changes in science, it's not just um, the thrill and the excitement there is that thing of compensation. And it, with our tuition being as high as it is, and students having to go into so much debt, that they need, there seems to be a need to look at, have high aspirations for e um, income in order to pay back whatever was borrowed, seems to me it's a vicious cycle. I, I, think and I, just I think you're conflating a few issues there. Uh, first of all, on the coaches or very high-powered, well-paid researchers in the medical school who are in that same arena of you know very high salaries, they bring back enormous revenue to the university. I mean. Jim Calhoun pays for himself over and over and over again like nobody else at the university, and same for a lot of our scientists at the health center, and that's empirically true, you know, easily documented. So let's put that aside for a second. There are people in the university who generate critical revenue for us, and they need to be paid, you know, what they would get far beyond UConn. We need to be with the rest of the country. We need to be with um, the international scene with regard to competitive salaries for great people. And I will you know, go to the mat on that anytime. In terms of tuition, there's no university president in the country who wants to raise tuition $1. <laughs> I mean, you know, we are educators. This is what we do. We would love to keep tuition uh, at, the, at the level of, of uh, 19... 61. <laughs> you know, that's a dream. And that was the dream of the American, of American public higher education. Um, we have to do business. We have to bring good faculty here. We have to have decent sized classes. We have to have uh, classroom facilities where things aren't falling apart. You know, we have to have stu serve students with regard to technology and activities and, you know, nice, reasonable dorms. Um, and we need to invest in the research infrastructure so that we can invent um, and, and keep our goals very high there with regard to invention. I mean, at places like UCHC, our health center, we really are trying to invent vaccines and, you know, find the cure for cancer. I mean, this is not lofty stuff. This is what it, we actually try to do over there. Um, now, educating students, you know, just undergraduate students, um, we have to do it well. Um, college is not just a place where you come in and we, we, you know, we charge minimal and then just get them out somehow. I mean, we want to give them very good faculty and a good experience. 
Um, all that said, we are an incredible bargain <laughs> at the University of Connecticut. Um, if you look at the big publics in the Northeast, we're on the low side, and certainly if you look at us compared to any private university. Uh, for the neediest students, we have extensive financial aid. Our value, in fact, is recognized in places like U.S. News um, because we have tried to keep tuition down. So you'll, I think you'll find we're on the low to very competitive side on tuition, um, and that's the context we live in. Again, you know, I'd love to charge zero, but, you know, we've got to be realistic about, about what we're trying to do. I see some of the parents who are paying, who I know who are paying private tuition, who are in this audience, who are thinking, yeah, UConn would be a bar. Yeah, bring them, yeah, maybe they'd like to transfer. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody, yes, you have a question here? My question would be about international students or faculty, especially partnerships at international level regarding faculty, students, or research projects. What future do you predict? Yeah, we're doing incredibly well there. Thanks to our provost, Peter Nichols has um, has been part of a project. I think there are about uh, 21 universities, prestigious universities around the world, have joined together in an organization uh, for faculty exchange. So we have that kind of very big global initiative going on. But you know, the truth, of it, the truth of it is that we want as many international students who are qualified to come to UConn as possible, because you know you need to bring the world to stores and to Farmington. Um, but on the other side of that, we need to send as many of our students as we can abroad. And you know that going abroad, even just for a month or two, can really transform someone's life. So when, when I go out and try to raise money and talk to our alumni about what I need um, with regard to undergraduate education, I often talk about this, you know, giving a small gift, not so, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, <laughs> that kind of <laughs> gift, um, to uh, help a student study abroad. Where, for example, we have a student uh, who, who could um, go abroad for just a summer. Um, or who are working but could go for a few weeks during a Christmas break. And um, there are programs like that offered by us or also other universities around the world where students can get some kind of um, worldview, get out of the United States and see how other people live and what they think. So in, in terms of philanthropy, there's a lot that can be done to support students getting out. And the same with faculty. I mean, we have faculty who are in demand internationally, um, whether, you know, uh, dramatists and fine arts or researchers in the health center or business school professors who really, they could go to all these international conferences and bring UConn to the world, but we do, we have to support them in this. Um, and we have, to, we have to help them afford it. So um, great question, but you're right. It's, it's two ways. It's you know, getting our people from UConn out to the world to brag on you know, what we do incredibly well and to share our findings and our knowledge, but also to bring people to us um, to share in what is a great university. Question? No questions from this audience? All right, I have a question for you then. Um, you said that when you, uh, when you first started, you said that you were going to spend a few months assessing UConn's strengths and weaknesses. You've talked a lot about the strengths today. Mm -hmm. Have you come up with some weaknesses, things that need immediate attention or long-term attention? Uh, well, we have a lot of challenges in the area of facilities, and I think that uh, any of you who know the campus see that we have done incredibly well you know, thanks to the Yukon 2000 project and, and other investments in the state with particular areas. But then there are other schools and colleges that really are not in facilities um, that are up to the kind of scholarship and teaching that you're doing. And fine arts would be a very good example and something that, um, that the dean there has, has argued for vehemently. So I'd say we have work to do in terms of facilities. Um, we do have work to do on the endowment and on fundraising. So those are two very big areas. Um, and of course, economic development and relations with industry. So that is one of our major gaps is um, we are not doing enough um, on the job creation front, but are uh, certainly um, our, uh, our kind of partnerships with industry and, and corporate Connecticut, if I can call it that, um, hence uh, a new leadership position at the vice president's level so that they report directly to me. So those are areas that need work and we gotta get the right leadership and the right resources put to them if we're gonna bring the university up. At about the time that the governor was appointing you, he also uh, talked about and is now in the process of organizing the realignment of the higher education mm -hmm. system in the state. Where does UConn fit into that realignment? 
Uh, well, we will be very good and the closest partners to the new Connecticut University system. Uh, they have appointed a new, I believe he's called a chancellor, but possibly a, a president. Uh, yeah, uh, Bob Kennedy. He was a president of the University of Maine. He's superb. Um, he is a, a person with a universe, research university background. I've already spoken to him about projects in common and what we can do together um, this fall and as we approach the legislative session. So I think we'll be two of the best friends that you see in Connecticut um, because the Connecticut State Universities, the community colleges, um, they do so much for us. They bring us wonderful students um, who transfer to us. Um, but they also are, are partners in local communities with regard to, you know, culture and um, workforce development. So we belong to, we're not in competition with them, and anybody who would try to pit us against each other um, would not understand that we're partners and that we get more from cooperating with each other than competing. So um, it's one, you know, his appointment is one of the best things to happen, at least to us at UConn, because we will work so closely with him. Well, President Herbst, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining sure. us today at the Old State House. We're going to take you up on your offer to come back again. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>